Hello and welcome back to the Mission Shunya podcast. First things first, wishing you a very happy new year 2022. I hope we all can get over the pandemic soon and return to what was once normal. But let's not let our guard down, so please stay safe. Just to let you know that 2022 will be another big year for Mission Shunya, the podcast, the blog, and other support activities online and offline so here's the first episode for this year discussions around climate change is not a new topic on this podcast platform but what we are going to discuss on this episode is a little different in a way as always we have an expert for the conversation but this time around our guest is well known in an allied field but in recent years he brings together that experience to his passion projects around environmental conservation and climate change pravin has spent four decades in non life insurance working in few countries around the world as a recognized thought leader pravin is a frequent speaker at several national and international forums his topics of interest include esg climate risk ethics and diversity i have been following his work for some time now and i'm sure you'll enjoy this conversation so without further ado here's the features segment hello praveen welcome to the mission shunya podcast glad to have you on the show today thank you girish uh, it's my pleasure and i'm honored uh, that you called me here thank you so much praveen for the last few years when i've been following your blog and your work most of it has been centered around your interest in environmental issues sustainability climate change diversity and so on but you have had a second career so this is probably a second career <laughs> how has the journey been until this point for you a oh, wonderful uh, well you know it's it's been uh, first passion if i may say so uh, it's been okay. uh, an ongoing obsession uh, which has been on for a long time my interest in nature and my concern about some of the issues which were getting uh, serious uh, has been always ongoing but i thought at some point of time i should pause my full time career and start looking at things which i passionately believe in and you're right climate change diversity all these are uh, various uh, uh, i would say uh, without hesitating an earth shaking uh, kind of combination of issues which we need to attend to and perhaps you know more than we it is me who needs to uh, be mindful of these and do something about them so last two and a half years i've been vigorously networking uh, digging into my past networks reading occasionally speaking occasionally traveling unfortunately the covid came in pretty uh, quickly after i got into my game but uh, it's 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 been a great uh, uh, you know feeling to jump in and explore and each day i realize how much new i have to learn and how much of what i learn i need to share and how much of what i uh, uh, learn each day becomes less and less every other day so if i stop reading and every day i spend 6 to 7 hours reading uh, and i realize wow now i'm fairly Uh, up to date with uh, most of the issues that i was exploring but next day i realize i need to start with a zero again you know so it's 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 a very uh, fascinating uh, journey and and i'm sharing whatever i'm learning in the areas that are of most interest to me uh, i'm i'm also aligning with young people and and that is most fascinating because that's where i think we need to invest most because they are the ones who are going to inherit the planet from us and and we better give it to them in as healthy a shape and form as possible so you know that's a bit of a roundabout answer but uh, that's how it feels that is true so as a professional you have been associated in the risk and insurance industry for a long time and when you look at this when you look at climate change and at first at the broad level at the top level what do you think are the major risk from climate change thanks for asking that you know that's a very 
powerful uh, uh, inquiry, if I may say so, rather than just a question. And, uh, you know, I'll borrow something from Tom Friedman, the famous uh, author and journalist of our times. And he, he uses a phrase somewhere which uh, says, Father Greed is pushing Mother Nature too hard and Mother Nature is retaliating. And it's all resulting into uh, what I believe is systemic risks. Uh, it's, it's a combination of ever-evolving known and unknown. Some of the known risks keep on intensifying as never before. Others are overlapping and or manifesting in hitherto unknown forms, making it a dangerous interplay. Yet others, like Correct. intergenerational, are of far-reaching consequences. Uh, the cut siloed approach, that is what bothers me towards addressing them, is not helpful at all. So storms, heat waves, glacial mass, sea levels going up, pollution, zoonotic diseases, all these are overlapping. And if you look at India, you know, uh, we, we face virtually all of this and much more. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, we, we continue developing assets in vulnerable areas. Look at uh, just sea level rise and just take three cities, Mumbai, Chennai and Kolkata. All of them could be significantly underwater, um, perhaps uh, in, in many uh, many of us, you you for much younger than me, and God forbid, uh, there could be a possibility that you could see it in your lifetime. And definitely the younger lot will see submergence of many of these cities. Uh, we'll have climate refugees. True. We have the Indo-Gangetic plains, which are fed by glacial waters. Eventually, the rivers emanating from Himalayas are all glacial fed. And... Uh, if you know initially the glaciers will melt fast and that will flood the plains and then there will be no water because the glaciers would have gone. Uh, now imagine uh, millions of people running towards cities. Uh, there will be nothing to stop them uh, or, or engage them uh, to, to divert them. And you know that's, that's a huge, huge risk. Uh, look at uh, uh, what is happening. You know we used to take our west coast uh, uh, of the subcontinent for granted that, you know, it is fairly, uh, you know, uh, free from major hurricanes or cyclones or whatever you call them, wind storms. Uh, it's the East Coast, which is notorious. But now we're seeing increased Correct. climatic uh, uh, action leading to storms and hurricanes and cyclones building up on the Arabian Sea side. So it's not just the Bay of Bengal. Very recently, we had uh, uh, the, the um, cyclone Gulab uh, originating from Bay of Bengal. Actually, when I was reading about it, I realized that uh, the first buildup was in South China Sea. And then it crossed the Indian subcontinent, came across on the western coast, went as far as Oman, developed into uh, what was named as Shaheen, and came and hit the west coast. Now... This certainly was uh, one of the first major uh, kind of manifestation of this kind, but this was definitely not the last. Uh, author Amitav Ghosh, uh, I'd love to quote him because I follow him closely and having known him from uh, his times in uh, the university I went to, uh, basically he alludes to a uh, situation of Mumbai, particularly in context of uh, two uh, nuclear facilities within the precincts of city of Mumbai uh, as a Fukushima possibility. So, you know, these atomic power plants or facilities are located at sea level and God forbid, as he says, if uh, a storm or a hurricane or cyclone, whatever you call it, were to hit uh, that side of the city directly, there would be a major panic and disaster. So, so all these things are building up. Now, you know, we, when we think of all this, we are thinking of physical side of the risk. But then, you know, city like Correct. Mumbai uh, is the financial capital. Uh, you know, it's not just Mumbai that will be impacted when you have panic. It's the boards uh, who are also responsible for climate change and related uh, manifestations. Uh, the stock price, the employee morale, 
uh, the customers, other stakeholders, everyone gets drawn in. And then the insurers would react and they would say, okay, we will not cover this or we will cover only this. And uh, this is how we will price it because we can't help it. There'll be bankruptcies, Correct. stuff like that. We are seeing that in California. We are seeing that in uh, Australia and, and now in parts of Europe. So, you know, these are high, new, highly complex and destabilized domain of risks, which is emerging, uh, which includes the risk of collapse of key social and economic systems at local and potentially even global levels, according to the Institute of uh, public and policy research, uh, this affects virtually all areas of policy and politics. And it's doubtful that societies are adequately prepared to manage this risk. Uh, The way we analyze, deal with, or anticipate these systemic risks need to be revisited. So we we have a massive task on hand. And uh, I think we are at best reactive. We need to wake up to all these realities. And these are things which make me sometimes over anxious. And that's the point, uh, you know, which uh, I was trying to make when you first asked me about this journey. Uh, Thanks for giving me this opportunity to relay this uh, message out uh, to, to your network of listeners. You did mention about systemic risk and also what happens in a city like Mumbai where boardrooms and leadership kind of debate all these issues. Now, if you look at the perspective of businesses, I mean, all businesses to a large extent face risk from climate change. Yes. So how do you think they are bracing up for this? I'm sure not everyone is on the same page like in this matter. A lot of businesses are a little further ahead and a lot of others are probably not even woken up to the reality. So what's your take on that? Absolutely, Girish. I mean, that's uh, another brilliant question. And uh, I would, you know, use some jargon once in a while. I hate to call it a jargon, but, uh, you know, I want to use two phrases, for instance. One is ESG. Uh, It's the environmental societal governance, uh, you know, uh, the Trimurti, if I may use Sanskrit, uh, or the triple bottom line focus, where, you know, you you have the planet uh, and people with profits you know so so once you have a focus on these issues everything then goes on track now it's very unfortunate uh, that uh, most businesses haven't yet taken to esg or triple bottom line in the true spirit and unfortunately a lot of them like we've seen recently the net zero commitments, everyone's jumped and given commitments without really a serious action plan. And they are talking about 2050 and thereafter. Correct. But what happens in terms of actionables now, that is most important. Uh, Moreover, there is no hiding for anyone. Uh, There is enough science backed by scenario modeling. Uh, The outcome will be a function of how you mitigate, adapt and foster resilience. The problem is that we continue behaving like ostriches. Uh, The first line of action has to be how do you decarbonize uh, your business rather than indulge in ambiguous measures like carbon swaps or capture. Our ongoing overt addiction to fossil fuel, which is at the center of climate change, uh, or covertly by greenwashing what looks very rosy but isn't, will only lead us to stranding of assets, which is another phrase that most of us have to get used to. Correct. Uh, Moreover, uh, there is a north-south divide, which is fairly significant. So the global north's uh, GHG, which is the greenhouse gas emission, has since the industrial revolution left very little room for the global north as it aspires to grow and in the process emit there's very little room left for them. Ironically, it is the global south which is already paying a price for the adventurism and plunder of the developed economies. Uh, you look at Africa, look at Pacific Islands. Uh, the latter, may, many of them, uh, regrettably, uh, uh, will disappear at, at the rate at which the icebergs and glaciers are melting and the sea levels are rising. 
and Africa, poor Africa, you know, has uh, a very in a minuscule contribution to carbon dioxide emissions, but the way it gets hammered by forces of nature is highly disproportionate. So their businesses will face far more disproportionate consequences. Much of America's and Europe will be challenged by rising sea levels and the multiple consequences of warming. Russia with truly little waterfront assets and the Arctic meltdown was supposedly to benefit the most from this. Siberia is being touted to become a granary of the world. Uh, with the rapid permafrost thawing, release of methane and the rising temperatures, the outcomes may turn out to be quite different. So there are too many unknowns and, and we don't know which side all these trends or these forces will tip. So, so you know, it's, it's essentially realization of these uh, serious forces that the humans have unleashed that needs to be understood. And particularly the financial services, whether it's banks, asset managers, insurers, all these guys have to uh, come to terms with this. Fossil fuel has to be set aside. A renewal pathway has to be put in place, which would bring in renewable energy and sustainability and, and climate equity for the world at large. And boardrooms have to be seized with all these realities. Unfortunately, most boardrooms don't have this competence. So what do you expect, you know, the rank and file to, to, to address in, in, you know, such issues to about and, and in time? Well, you do mention early on that it has to be all about people, planet, and I mean, it is currently profits, but I would say something like prosperity for all. Yes. But I'm sure there are some businesses who are doing a good job with this. Yes. Would you be able to cite some examples on that? Absolutely. You know, so again, I, you know, I will give both sides of it to, to be more objective. Uh, you know, so, so I was looking at uh, a report by PwC, which, which uh, rated uh, uh, what you call clean tech, uh, primarily uh, uh, consisting of mobility and transportation to be uh, the biggest uh, draws for to, to be headed in the right direction. Uh, likewise, uh, two countries, Denmark and Costa Rica, uh, they, they have really passionately uh, kind of uh, gone for BOGA, which is beyond oil and gas uh, alliance, and basically uh, trying to totally decarbonize their industrial and any every form of carbon footprint. Now, these are still very small successes, but once the buildup starts happening, they will be great role models. And I think we need more action, more uh, dynamism in this space, more leadership, more stewardship to ensure this moves in the right direction. Who has consistently shown progress in this regard? Well, it, as, as I told you, transport mobility have attracted most capital. In general, energy and food are still lagging. You know, those are two very big sources of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases. And those need to be very quickly addressed. India, for instance, is rapidly growing its solar energy generation, which is good news. However, it must quickly do something to uh, store and deploy this solar energy, which could thereby diminish uh, the use of thermal as a source of energy generation and thereby uh, the, the exploitation of uh, our uh, mineral uh, resources, particularly coal, which means you indulge in deforestation, which means you displace indigenous people, which means you will never have a situation where, uh, you know, these natural forms of circularity of, uh, of, of uh, the natural processes would happen. So carbon dioxide and all that uh, would, uh, the levels would keep on going up 
if the forests are gone. Correct. Um, have, having said that, my last thing I want to mention is that it's it's uh, good to say that we want more solar energy, we want more electrical vehicles, and we want more wind energy. But having said that, solar panels, EVs, and windmills uh, and also need to address their bio degradable quotient to remain sustainable eventually because you know once they live through their lifetime uh, they they need to be dumped somewhere we don't want uh, to repeat what we have already done uh, with uh, the fossil fuel uh, to also be done with the renewable energy generators so all these are you know the flip flop situations where you uh, where things look very rosy now but uh, we can't be short sighted we need to think long term and and before we start congratulating ourselves we need to constantly address this so that the future generations uh, do not blame us for being uh, ostriches or for being myopic well that's a very valid statement we need to look at what we can live for the future generations to come absolutely now going back to the sector where you have a significant expertise risk insurance industry is is a keen observer of this sector of any space in general because everything to an extent is largely involving them now how has their evaluation of the space kind of changed in the last decade or so the incidents that you mentioned early on in the conversation have definitely been been an eye opener of sorts for the industry but how has it changed and how is it going to evolve in the next few years yeah that's uh, another uh, very uh, thought provoking question uh, in fact um, the fundamental flaws persist uh, even though the insurance industry and the risk uh, industry uh, have become aware of all these unfolding forces they still work in silos and i'll just give you a few examples for instance the insurers are not only just risk carriers whereby you insure your risk with me but you also pay me premiums which uh, till such time a claim becomes a reality uh, is a float in the language of uh, mr warren buffett uh, and that float has to be invested correct so there has to be a uh, an investment process now when you look at how insurers invest and how insurers underwrite there is a disconnect and that's where i say there are silos and i can go on and on on that subject uh, but perhaps at another point of time uh, what also is happening is there is you know the insurance industry must come of age uh, that is something that i have been talking about for a very long time perhaps from my early days uh, in the industry itself so what happens is the insurance industry i call it the handmaiden of industry now what it ends up doing is just gets guided by what the industry wants it to do correct so all this while uh, the fossil fuel has been the centerpiece of from the very time uh, from the early days of industrial revolution and insurance came in uh, as a support system to that unfortunately it has never challenged that reality uh, but it's time that it does that uh, in the process the insurance industry also disregards esg you know there is very little pushback coming from the insurance industry uh, so thereby you know all the manipulations the greenwashing tends to get uh tends to get uh, also translated or uh, you know uh, transferred to the insurers we now have more precise metrics and micro evaluation the carbon dioxide levels have gone up to 417 plus uh, ppm it needs to be brought down to under 350 ppm correct it's not just carbon dioxide it's methane uh, so this money pipeline is very very critical and insurance industry is much as much a part of this as asset managers and banks are um, so to again uh, reinforce my message i'm saying that it cannot be in bed with 
an industry that is causing serious proven harm to the very ecosystem that sustains us very recently uh, you know the, the, if you look at globally the american insurers are big culprits <laughs> they have been hand in glove with the fossil fuel industry uh, the european uh, entities by and large uh, but for a few big players have decided not to support the insurance of coal but they are still continuing to support insurance of oil and gas now that's a, there's a big problem so 20, 23 big insurers have moved out of uh, insuring coal related activities okay now this, this there is a gap and uh, there's uh, someone i follow very closely who's been a big critic of it peter bossard he he runs the sunrise project out of california and it's a global activism uh, platform if i may use that phrase and and he says that it's primarily you know that the insurance industry has come out of the coal power because it only adds up to 6 billion dollars of annual premiums <laughs> whereas uh, the oil and gas accounts for 17 billion so money premiums all these is short sighted approach uh we have to think in long terms we have to keep this planet and its uh, systems the biodiversity and all other planetary boundaries uh, in a healthy shape if we were to look at only short term benefits and profitability and quarter to quarter outcomes uh, then we are out to finish this planet and the chances and hope for long term existence of not just homo sapiens but all living forms so that's that's uh, the larger reality girish which i thought i should take the liberty of highlighting howsoever gruesome it looks but uh, that is how it is well i really like the notion of the insurance industry in kind of looking at a sector from the premium that it offers i'm sure all businesses look at that angle as well but i'm sure that will also give insurance industry a uh, interest in climate change because invariantly the premium is going to be high in the sector so i hope they don't expect a higher premium because of climate change but uh, rather there is a systemic shift that happens in how businesses are acting towards it absolutely so on that note we will look at the other subject that is very close to your heart diversity oh yes i mean climate change sustainability but you still feel there is a lack of diversity in this space right yes absolutely so insurance unfortunately tends to uh, keep itself aloof from other systems and the larger reality of this planet and unfortunately that's what i call uh, operating in a silo you know that's another manifestation now look at you know i i i'm influenced by some of the thinkers the greatest thinkers of our times and one of them is sir david attenborough and and you know he gives an example and if i tell this to kind of a stereotypic insurance professional he may wonder why the hell am i telling <laughs> this but i'm i'm going to say it anyway look at how important biodiversity is and how nature Uh, has created this planet and the planetary systems over billions of years of evolution and resulted into millions of species many of them over the last uh, five extinctions and the sixth one facing us have disappeared yet the planet has amazing diversity and insurance has to mimic that diversity now what david uh, says is look at what have we made out of this planet you know we 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 who, who are the maximum creatures living on this planet there's human beings which is 7 billion plus we have uh, birds which is again predominantly uh, poultry uh, we have animals which is the pace at which we are killing uh, other uh, animals whether these are birds or terrestrial or ocean creatures we are only left with uh, the largest significant number is livestock correct so what 
are we doing with this planet and 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 how does insurance then uh, come into play ancient forests are being denuded under the pretext of you know uh, a, a, what you call search for new and new resources we we are so hungry for growth we believe we by exploiting the planetary uh, riches we can continue growing and prospering forever but unfortunately that is backfire and uh, you know when you remove forests you put in plantations now one of the most fashionable thing today and and again it is driven by partly human need and partly greed is palm oil plantations and and palm oil is mono monoculture it can never replace uh, what the forests do uh, and and again we are triggering uh, what you call tipping points which could drive us into either to uh, unknown and irreversible uh, terrain so so basically insurance has to be mindful of all these complexities it can be a steward of change you know it can always put its foot down and that's what i meant when i said it should come of age correct it can put its foot down and say this is not good for the planet this is not good for what we call the bio uh, diversity and ecological services bes in short uh, and you know there cannot be any uh, quid pro quo there cannot be any uh, risk transfer of this kind so if it comes of age it can really drive change in the right direction and it will help preserve diversity it will help foster diversity in in many unique ways rather than finish diversity that's a interesting perspective praveen on uh, why diversity is crucial and how risk insurance industry can actually look at it and add value to this rather than n- not helping it in that front so on that we can have a final word on why is diversity really crucial for climate change what's your view on that wonderful okay so you know i keep saying that it's not just about diversity it's also inclusivity now the challenge is you know the globe the planetary systems everything are so amazingly diverse uh, but we tend to pick and choose things in our image so we like to do things the way we we you know with people we like we like to do things which we believe more coming from people who are like us correct so that is kind of narrowing the way we look at things and the way we action things unfortunately that is not how it is it you know if only we bring in people who may have counter views uh, which is inclusivity uh, we will get to understand a uh, newer perspective we will understand their points of view we will uh, also have more resilient and more uh, outcome driven actions so like for instance you know i i had the pleasure of interviewing a lot of young women leaders uh, some of whom participated at the cop 26 and some of them were watching it closely from wherever they were one of the things they were all aghast about that cop 26 is the most important climate change uh, event which is supposed to be an annual thing big last year because of covid uh, it could not uh, take place uh, but having said that basically it was a white man show even white women were denied major role at the leadership positions of cop 26 uh, number 2 most problems on this planet are faced by the global south but it was global north which was predominantly present at that conference now you know you exclude women from global south you exclude youth from global south you exclude indigenous people who are the real uh, guardians of our forests and natural resources uh, and how do you then talk of climate justice it's 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 an empty talk correct um, so basically uh, you also you need input from both service providers and the user community 
it underlines the importance of partnerships between scientists, forecasters, disaster managers, community leaders, and decision makers. Uh, I, I recently uh, went through the World Meteorological uh, Organization, WMO, guidelines, uh, which provide coordinated impact-based forecast and warning services of multiple cascading hazards. For instance, a tropical cyclone, which triggers flooding, storm surge, wind damage, impacts on infrastructure, transport and energy, and health systems. So this need to incorporate extensive inputs from both service providers and user community. It underlines the importance of partnerships between scientists, forecasters, disaster managers, community leaders, and decision makers. So, so you know, this is what diversity is about. Correct. You, you can't sit in a silo. And the last thing I want to mention is that climate change has become a dominant or has always been a dominant European narrative. To gain acceptability and support in Global South, it must include the Global South's perspective as well. I can go on and on, like for instance, vaccines. You know, I, I see COVID as an extension of climate change. You know, We have pushed uh, Mother Nature and Mother Nature is now pushing us back uh, in various forms. COVID is one of those. We've butchered the forests. Uh, we've not treated the inhabitants of forests well. And, and you know, the, their diseases are jumping on to us and COVID is one of them. How do you build vaccines? You can't have one kind of vaccine for a diverse genetic sample, uh, which is quite differentiated across various continents of our planet. Uh, Africa, for instance, was left out uh, from clinical trials with the exception of South Africa. Now, tragedy number one is they haven't been receiving enough and timely vaccines for their large populations. Number two is basically, you know, even though vaccines come as as sub, as as an insurer of clinical trials, you know, that was an area which fascinated me a lot. I was really wonderstruck as to why, you know, the clinical trials in Africa were not carried out and and whether the 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 uh, vaccines developed from trials in other populations would uh, suit uh, the Africa, uh, African uh, requirement. Now, all these are examples of how diversity manifests, not just in insurance, but in nature, in science, in all aspects. And, and unless we are inclusive, we are going to miss out, you know, our long-term sustainability and well-being agenda. Well, Praveen, that's a wonderful note uh, to kind of wrap up this whole interesting conversation. You did bring about a good perspective, a good comparison. I'm sure when we look at COVID 10 years down the line and look at the events that are happening around climate change at that point in time, I'm sure people are going to come back and say like, yes, we predicted this, that this could happen when COVID struck. We said like climate change is going to be the next pandemic and we should have acted upon that. The pointers that you bring, like we should get the global south on the table get leaders from there, get get them on the table, Get make their opinions count. Those are really valuable points. And that is, in fact, what is diversity all about. It's getting people from all around the world, across sections, everyone involved in making decisions because this is a global issue and it matters when everyone has their voice heard. So it's been an insightful conversation, Praveen. Uh, you, did, you do bring a different perspective the, to the whole narrative about climate change from your experience in the risk industry and also as an observer and as a passionate enthusiast in the space. So thanks for taking time to join me on the conversation today. It's my pleasure, as I said, Girish, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I hope uh, it will make sense to uh, your network of listeners. And uh, I'm always there to keep building on this. Thank you very much once again. I hope you found the conversation insightful. I'm sure most of the events mentioned by Praveen, the different hurricanes and other climate-related events could be very fresh in our memories. To know more about Praveen and follow his work, you can connect on LinkedIn or follow the Diversity blog. 
The links will be in the show notes section as usual. He consistently posts new content that might be of interest to you. At this point, I would like to thank Gabriel, who was a guest on our podcast from Planet Tracker, for introducing me to Praveen. If you have any feedback or suggestions, you can reach me via email. Missionchunya at gmail dot com is the ID, or you can follow Missionchunya across social media channels. The handle is at Missionchunya. I will be back in two weeks' time with yet another insightful conversation. Until then, this is Girish Shivakumar signing off, and as always, thank you for listening.